The aging of the Old Testament opened up room for the New Testament. Jesus' ministry was the necessary factor in provoking the Christian tradition that grew from it. You don't get a New Testament without Jesus' ministry. A teacher of mine in the past said, where there's smoke, there's fire. And the smoke is the faith of the church. And the fire is the resurrection. I think here you can say that the smoke is the New Testament and the fire is Jesus' ministry. From the time of Jesus' resurrection, Christians were sharing traditions and shaping traditions. From the time of Jesus' resurrection, his disciples were sharing testimonies. In fact, the word apostle refers to someone who is a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And these circulate as the apostles found churches. And you can see the circulation of those traditions in the writings of early Christians, including ones that aren't in the New Testament. The second letter of Clement, which Clement may or may not have written, includes traditions of Jesus that resemble those in the Gospels. So churches of the Roman world are sharing Jesus's testimonies, and then these are beginning to be written down after the first couple of decades. And churches circulated letters from the apostles and from representatives of the apostles, and then those letters started being called scriptures, the scriptures of Paul. You can see 2 Peter 3 refers to Paul's writings among the scriptures. And then as we saw from those lists, collections of scriptures, the four gospels, the corpus of Paul's writing, and so on. Christians were very networked from the beginning. They would pass on letters and scriptures to other churches in what one author calls a holy internet. The early centers of circulating, preserving, and also verifying these writings were Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem is where it all started, and it was a major force until the destruction of Jerusalem around AD 70. And the church in Rome. Rome was the center of an empire with a great communications network, a good messenger system. All roads lead to Rome. And so the church in Rome became a kind of clearinghouse for validating scriptures and circulating them to other churches. And this is how you get the kind of consensus in the center of that star cluster, and also where you get the debates on the periphery. With that kind of networking, all kinds of things are circulating. Other gospels purporting to tell the story of Jesus's life or his infancy or his teachings. Other acts of apostles. One popular piece of fan fiction was the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Apocalypses, not just the Apocalypse of John and Peter, you saw that earlier, a contested one, a debated one. Other letters and correspondence. Some of these circulated officially and some of them were genuine, but still not regarded as canonical. Clement's first letter and so on. Some of them were fanfic, popular and probably taken literally by a lot of the readers, but not canon. 20 New Testament writers were universally accepted in the early church, besides outliers like Marcion. We don't see lists without them. So those are the center of the star cluster, or the center of the solar system. At the margins, Pluto and the other planetoids are writings like Hebrews, which as you saw has high respect but not universal respect, the letter of James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Those took longer to win acceptance throughout the churches, but they already had pretty widespread acceptance, it seems, from the very beginning, judging from their presence on so many of these lists. I want to give you an analogy for the way these traditions developed from the original events to the collections of writings that we call the New Testament. I mentioned that Jesus was the necessary cause of all of this. Without Jesus' ministry, you just don't get a New Testament. So I'd like you to think of the New Testament as a pearl, which begins with an irritant. I grew up hearing that it began with a grain of sand that irritated the oyster, but fun fact, oysters can expel sand. What usually begins a pearl is a different kind of irritant, some kind of organic matter or some kind of problem in the oyster itself. And to take care of the irritant, the oyster generates nacre, which is what gives the pearl its luster. And you get layer after layer after layer of nacre. Well, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Where there's nacre, there's something underneath that provoked it. And there are earlier layers. So I pulled an interesting picture of a cross-section of a freshwater pearl off the internet. And I want to make it a metaphor for the generation of the New Testament writings. In the lower part, you see probably the original irritant, which grows. And then, this is really kind of cool, 
This particular pearl grew not just from its original irritant, but from another one which combined along the way. That'll serve as a nice metaphor for the complicated origins of the New Testament writings. The original irritant is Jesus's ministry. The earliest layers of nacre are the developing original tradition. And then you can see the nacre gets darker as time goes on. I'm going to compare that to the consolidating traditions of the apostles. And then at a certain point, things just get stable and the pearl only gets bigger. I chose a complicated pearl because the history of the New Testament is complicated. It's not an ideal spherical pearl. There are fault lines because there are times when the traditions have conflicted. And there's a really interesting interface between the original Christian tradition and its encounter with a foreign tradition, the philosophical assumptions of the Greco-Roman world. After a while, these two have fused and you get a stable synthetic tradition and the pearl just gets bigger and bigger. It doesn't really change. What biblical scholars do is, in a sense, they are the ones with the saws cutting the cross section to try to construct a story that recovers the likely past of this pearl. Of course, you can't take a saw to the present and cut into the past and see it. You have to take what's available in the present and try to reconstruct a past which is over. So critical history constructs a cross section. It doesn't just peer directly in. We can't do that with the past. So how does this apply to the New Testament? And all along, at least after the beginning, this pearl looks like a pearl. Its outer finish is already lustrous. Christians in the early church didn't think of themselves as the early church. They thought of themselves as the church. The medieval church didn't think of itself as medieval. It's always a pearl, but it's a pearl that's changing very gradually. Here's how I'd like to develop this metaphor. Think of the original provocation as Jesus's ministry around 30 AD. And think of the first layers of nacre, these lighter colored layers, as the traditions of the churches that were founded by Jesus's apostles from anywhere between 30 and 100 AD. Then there's a second layer where things are more settled, but not that settled. I'm going to call those proto-canonical traditions. The Miratonian fragment gave us a nice look at the traditions of the consolidating church of the second century. And then things mature even further. The maturing universal Roman church's tradition from 200 to 380. It's still maturing. And what's this second pearl that's pressing in and shaping the Christian one? It's the classical and later Greco-Roman tradition, especially that of Platonism, which was enormously influential. Once it's incorporated, you get the kind of oblong shape of the developing synthetic New Testament tradition of the medieval church. The texts are stable. The lists are the same. But how people are interpreting those texts is shaped both by the original apostolic traditions and by imported Greco-Roman tradition. We won't be focusing on any of this really in a course on the New Testament. I just want you to see that we don't get the Bible right out of the hands of the apostles. We're going to be focusing on the material here in the middle. And today's lecture is really about the canonization process between here and here. This is just a metaphor. This is just a picture of a pearl I pulled off the internet. Don't take this too literally. The early letters of Paul start within about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. His later letters, as well as probably 1 Peter, although that's hard to date, and it's hard to date the letters of John, they reflect a later stage after more layers of knacker have accumulated. And then over here, I've put the Gospels. I've put Mark closer. It's not as close as Paul. Mark was probably written closer to AD 70. And then Luke, Matthew, and John seem aware of Mark. Luke and Matthew are actually drawing on Mark. That's what scholars widely think. And I think John is reacting to Mark and assuming that his readers know Mark. So you can think of the four Gospels as layers of knacker that preserve what's in the middle. And then some letters on the left, they too are hard to date. Revelation looks a little later. People like to date it around 90 AD. Second Peter, I put at the, at the outside, nearly at the threshold where I talked about the canon. Um, second Peter seems pretty late. It could even be second century. James and Jude are hard to date, and I put them on one side of a fault line, and I put Hebrews on the other side of a fault line. 
Now, I don't want you to read this in terms of which came first. The fault line I'm thinking of is more of a theological fault line. The letter to the Hebrews reflects a more Greek standpoint, whereas James and Jude reflect a more Hebraic standpoint. The church started out as a multicultural church. You can see that in the earliest writings of Paul, as well as the book of Acts. And the fault line between more Hellenistic Christians and more Hebraic Christians really exploded in the controversy over whether Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised. And you see within the New Testament this fault line between more Hebraic and more Hellenistic imaginations. All of them are preserving memories of Jesus, but they are interpreting those memories of Jesus in distinct ways. I've labeled this Greco-Roman tradition Athens, and the tradition under it, the earlier one, I've labeled Jerusalem. That's not really historically accurate, but it is a way that an early church leader, Tertullian, drew a contrast between those two traditions. He said, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What do we need Greek philosophies for when we have the apostolic traditions of Jesus Christ? So that represents a fault line within early Christianity. I just want you to see that that fault line goes back. Finally, this layer here, I'm referring to as the canonization process. The canonization process comes after the writings are written, as they're being evaluated and widely used, and as a few debates are springing up about contested writings. The canonizing process comes later than the writings themselves. And by the way, I've only mentioned the writings that end up canonized. Don't forget about all the uncanonized material. Some of it's good and respected and used by Christian leaders, some of it is not good, and it's rejected as really unfaithful to Jesus' traditions and unfaithful to the faith of his apostles. It's a messy world that produces the New Testament. We'll get a better picture of that as we look in the individual books. What determined whether a writing could be qualified as canonical? Well, first of all, it needed to be written by apostles or sourced by apostles. Remember, apostles could use scribes to take down their dictation, or they could even entrust some of the writing process to their assistants. They needed to be sourced back from the apostolic age, from the age of the apostles or their immediate successors, because as you've seen with a game of telephone, the more distance there is with your sources, the less you can trust that they're accurate. Writings needed to be consistent internally, consistent with themselves, and they needed to be consistent with other respected scriptures and they needed to be consistent with the faith of the church. If I write a gospel that's just off the wall with a Jesus that people don't recognize, it's not gonna win acceptance. As you've already seen, a major factor in whether a writing was considered canonical was whether churches would read it along with the prophets and the apostles. So not just from a church authority, and not just orthodox, and not just early, but enjoying that kind of respect to be read as normative. I know I'm repeating myself, and I'm doing it to stress that this process of canonization was not arbitrary, it wasn't willy-nilly, and it wasn't incompetent. The ancient world needed standards for judging whether something was legitimate or not, just like we do today. You don't trust anything that's on the internet. You don't trust a letter just because it says it comes from Paul. You have to verify it. The canonizing process is an early Greco-Roman version of today's legal process sifting through evidence and testimony to determine what's reliable and what's not. When you testify in court, they don't just take your word for it. You're cross-examined. You're sworn in. Your testimony is compared with other, perhaps conflicting testimony. Once it's been through the vetting process, an appeals court is going to look at your testimony and not re-verify everything because it's already been handled. That's how we arrive at trustworthy information in a low-trust environment. Well, the ancient world was a low-trust environment, just like today's internet is a low-trust environment. So the ancient world developed procedures to determine what was right and what was rumor. 